Thank you. Okay, so hello everyone. Uh, this is Fatan. I'm Pavel. We're developers at SAP, and today we'll talk about content reuse in Autobots. You are probably wondering right now what the hell is an Autobot, right? Well, nothing. Um, we completely made that up. It's an automatically generated chatbot. Very cool, I know. Um, if we said chatbots right away, it would pr probably sound boring and simple, and we wouldn't have, well, this many people show up here. <laughs> and this way, it sounds like we're talking about transformers. So, yeah, um, we won't, though. What we actually talk about is how to actually use chatbots in software documentation. We will take you through uh, the journey we've had working on this topic, what we've learned in the process, and what we plan to do ahead. So, first of all, I'd like to take a few minutes to actually talk about user interface, because it has been evolving from text UI to graphical UI to now conversational UI. Imagine this situation. You're uh, sitting at home, playing around with your lights. Say you want to programmatically uh, turn your lights on at exactly 8 p.m. each evening. You, that's when you get home from work. You don't want to flip the switch on manually. And basically, you're just a nerd looking for an excuse to play around with an Arduino. So you get one, and you program it, and you install it, and it does the job. And that's text UI. The interface is basically code itself. Then it hits you. You're still kind of young. You go out, even though you're obviously a programmer. So you're not home exactly at 8 p.m. each evening. And you decide to instead write an app for your phone. So this time, when you get home, you open your app, click a button, and the lights are lit. So that's graphical user interface. However, since you're a programmer, you're probably also lazy, and you don't want to click anything, so you'll throw all of that stuff out. And instead, you get a smart home assistant device. So this time you get home, you call your device by its name, and you tell it to turn the lights on. And that's everything. That's conversational UI. And that's basically chatbots and what we're going to talk about today. So, as you know, such technology is uh, already here. It's not something futuristic. I'm sure a lot of you have such devices at home. And basically, it's getting better and better, and very quickly so. For example, one feature of um, Google Home Assistant that uh, fascinates me is how it can actually recognize your voice. So when you ask it, where is my phone, it can actually ring your phone, not your girlfriends, uh, boyfriends, roommates, or whoever's. So yeah, basically, conversational UI is the next step in the evolution of user interface. So the question that remains is, how do we apply that to software documentation? Well, for starters, few users even read documentation nowadays, at least in its most common form. So by using chatbots in documentation, one obvious benefit is that you can offload some support to them and basically cut some costs from support staff. The not so obvious benefit is that chatbots can also actually generate more revenue. For example, by decreasing the response time to support queries, you basically increase your customer satisfaction. And by increasing customer satisfaction, you increase your sales and hence generate more revenue. Your brand is more trusted, your product is um, more inclined to be used again because your users feel safe using it. They feel like they will be supported. So the problem with live support is that the staff can handle usually up to six conversations each. As you can imagine, a chatbot can handle virtually an unlimited amount of conversations. And there are a lot of simple tasks that chatbots can automate that live support currently does. Usually, uh, these are more suitable to be consulting type tasks. Why consulting? Because in theory, this is where it gets quite hypothetical, but if your documentation is comprehensive enough, um, every consulting task should be solvable with a, the perfect reference to it. So chatbots are suitable to actually automate that. Now you'll say that, of course, there are more complex tasks, and what about these? Well, for these, chatbots can simply fall back to live support. For the more simple ones, if they manage to uh, process them, that's great, that's instant success and value. If they can't, then simply fall back to a live person. So there's no loss in that whole situation. It's a win-win, or well, a win-nothing. So the chatbot can even not have the purpose of solving the support request at all. 
its only purpose could be just to dispatch the user request to the right kind of support, to the right department, to the right person to actually handle it. Let me share you a quick story to try and explain what I mean. So about two months ago, maybe, my internet connection was down. So I naturally call the support line. And I say, hi, my internet connection is down. So the friendly employee on the other side tells me, um, hello, sir, please wait for a minute. So I wait for a minute, about five times probably. And then I hear a second voice telling me, hello, sir, what is your issue? So they knew that I was a sir. They did not know what my issue was, though. So I repeat again that my internet connection was down. And then they ask me if the light of my router was green. I go and check. It was. So I say it is green. And then they tell me, please wait on the phone for a minute, sir. So I wait another seven or eight times. And then I hear a third voice. Hello, sir, what is your issue? So I repeat, this time a bit more frustrated than before. And then they ask me if I have tried turning the router off and on again. So you can imagine my frustration at that point after 15 minutes of listening to the nice catchy tunes of the support line. And probably clearly identify a thing or two which could be improved in that whole process. So if they had a very simple and straightforward chatbot to ask me these two very simple and straightforward questions, and that's very easy to make, they could basically send, save me a lot of time, a lot of frustration, and they could also probably lay off some staff. So anyways, let's talk adoption. How far have chatbots actually gone adoption-wise? Well, according to a research done by COM100, 59% of all current support chats actually involve chatbots. Sounds like a lot, more than half. However, only 27% of these 59% are actual conversations from start to finish, complete conversations, which means that the rest 72% of users actually drop off at some point. Now, they can drop off for a lot of reasons, of course, but you can imagine that the most common one is that they simply don't find value in the conversation. The chatbot is not serving its purpose. And according to another research done by Happy Fox Chat, ironically, 72% of users of live support are satisfied with the service. So you can see that there is a big gap between the two and definitely a lot of ground to cover for chatbots concerning efficiency. So that's an iFi chart. Let's start talking about what actually we do. So in the past, I think, tr three years now, um, kind of as a side project, aside from our day jobs, uh, we have played around with a series of prototypes to try out stuff, to try to learn things and how they should work. Uh, and in the process, we've identified some clear business problems. We will first try to define the business problems and then kind of use these definitions to actually try to evaluate each uh, prototype as um, we have progressed with them. So please pay attention. <laughs> so firstly, uh, chatbots struggle to reuse content. What they usually look like is they have a predefined set of questions and answers and a natural language processing algorithm which maps the um, user queries to the questions, which on their behalf are mapped to an answer, and this is propagated to the user. So practice has taught us that these are both uh, time consuming to develop, as you have to train the NLP manually, type in all the questions and answers and so on, and even more time consuming to maintain actually. So reusing any available content, in our use case that's documentation, uh, user guides, FAQs, whatever, is extremely important. So to recap, by consuming existing resources, we want to develop chatbots faster and make them more maintainable. Secondly, technical writers, the creators of the content, actually hold the knowledge of how a product is used. However, they don't have the technical skills to actually develop chatbots, so they cannot apply that knowledge directly. They have to work very closely with a developer kind of in a micromanagement way, which is usually not very efficient, to actually make sure that everything is done right. They also have the responsibility and ownership of the content, so it really makes sense that the responsibility and ownership of the chatbot is also theirs, because basically it's an interface for that content. 
So to address these two, we want to actually enable technical writers themselves to develop chatbots on their own. So we'll call that technical writer empowerment. Sounds very almighty. So by enabling non-deaf people to actually develop chatbots, we want to enable two things. We want to enable the creators to be the ones who are most fit to be the creators, not the ones who are simply technically capable to be, and also have a single person be able to both develop the chatbot as well as maintain it, as well as its content. Because in the real world, these two are usually different people because they simply require very different skill sets. And lastly, NLPs are proven to work inefficiently in a large domain. Imagine you work in this big company, there's a lot of products, a lot of services, and you try to gather the knowledge for all of these in a single chatbot. The NLP quickly becomes a total mess, trust me. And it's also very hard to develop such chatbots. In, um, imagine this is a big shared code base of a source project that the entire company works upon. It doesn't sound exactly ideal if you work in a big one. Then again, you also have responsibility issues between all the different uh, collaborators and teams and so on. So yeah, it's not perfect. To address all of these, we want to kind of apply the microservice principle in software architecture to actually building chatbots. What I mean by that is we want to separate the domains for um, each chatbot in separate NLPs to have them work more efficiently and doing so without the user having to select the right chatbot to talk with. In their eyes, it's a single chatbot. They don't have to know that there are a lot of agents in the back end. And meanwhile, it's actually a network of chatbot agents, each serving a specific purpose and use case, communicating bot to bot um, and cooperating to resolve the user request. So we refer to that in the spirit of making words up, microbots. So by disassembling use cases into actually small domain bots, we want to have the NLPs work better, and we also enable the distribution of responsibility and work between different teams and basically different par parties. So once again, to recap, we have content reuse, technical writer empowerment, and microbots. To move on with how we actually began working on stuff, having these three in mind, I'll uh, let Satan share with you our experiences about our first project called Tina. Yes, so we started around three years ago with this small project called Tina, and the goal seemingly was simple create a chatbot for software documentation. So behind the project were one usability expert and one technical writer. And they set this goal to create a chatbot banking on all the hype and advertisement that anyone can do it, no matter the technical skills. So they took a free online chatbot building tool that utilizes a no-code approach to building chatbots, and they got started. And they actually managed to produce a bot. And it had several capabilities like uh, search functionality and step-by-step uh, -step guiding for technical procedures. However, it had one big downfall. It was purely predefined and pre-configured manually by the technical writer. So what do I mean by this? The process went something like this. The technical writer will take this, a subset of the documentation and they will identify different fragments from the content that they want to use for the chatbot. Then the technical writer will start brainstorming and entering into the tool all of the ways they can think of that a user can ask for those particular fragments of content. After that is done, the technical writer will go and copy over the, the content into the tool as answers to the questions they entered earlier. Sounds like a lot of manual work, right? But with this, and this is how it looked like. And keep in mind, this is only a very small fraction of what a chatbot for our end goal would look like if we go with this bot building approach. Imagine having to maintain this mess. And this was pretty much our main takeaway for this bot building approach. It's just too much manual work. Yeah, it, probably there are use cases where it's fine, but he has a huge problem when it comes to scaling the content. So yes, doing it by hand is possible to an extent, but as the scope grows, the complexity grows with it. Not to mention that the whole idea of taking something from the content and copying it over into the tool creates a huge double maintenance problem. 
So when you actually want to update something in the documentation, because things change, things are not constant, you will have to do it once in the documentation, in the content, and once you have to go and do it again in the tool for the chatbot, which is definitely not ideal. However, it wasn't all bad. Having something that was quick and simple to do at the same time enabling us to actually go to users and test our idea with them proved to be exactly what we needed at the time. And really, we did have, th we did have that. Here's how our, the landing page of our documentation looked three years ago. And you can see the chat button in the bottom right corner. So we could give this to actual people and collect feedback. And so we did. And the users we tested it with uh, reacted very positively to the whole concept of a chatbot for documentation. And they also provided us with some very valuable feedback. For example, they mentioned that when we make the bot talk and um, behave like a human, they would expect more intelligence from it. And trust me, the bot in Project Tino was definitely not intelligent. Another thing, they mentioned that they see the best target group for such a bot to be new users who are not familiar with the product and navigating its documentation. With Project Tina, we also first started talking about technical writer empowerment, which Paolo defined earlier. Because here, everything was done by the technical writer, absolutely everything, end to end. And at least in our eyes, there was a, a lot of value that the technical writer had both the ability and responsibility of creating and maintaining the chatbot. However, this proved to have some very obvious technical limitations that really hindered the complexity of capabilities that the bot could have. And those could only be overcome by a development skill set. So, to sum up our first prototype, we'll look at this table, which will show us how the different um, problems that Pavel defined earlier were addressed with this project. In terms of content reuse, yeah, content was actually reused, kind of. It was based on the actual content from the documentation. However, the way it was done, copying things over, basically duplicating our content into another place, this was definitely not ideal and definitely not what we were targeting. So we weren't happy with how content reuse um, was tackled with this approach. In terms of technical writer empowerment, yeah, what's more empowering than doing all the work, right? The technical writer did absolutely everything. However, as I mentioned, this really came at the cost of the complexity of capabilities that the chatbot could have. So this is something that we needed to address. And in terms of microbots, at this point, we haven't really uh, reached the, state, the stage where we identified this as a problem. So it wasn't, obviously it wasn't considered. So this pretty much sums up our first prototype. It wasn't that great and it was definitely far off our end goal. However, it was a start and it also gave us some valuable feedback that we could apply to our next project. Speaking of that, well, care to share about that? Yeah, sure. Um, so the problem we saw was an immediate low-hanging fruit with Tina was definitely content reuse. So we tried to address that in the next project we um, tried out. And it was a chatbot for the documentation of a CAY tool using our company. Long story short, the reason we chose it is because the documentation for each command was presented in a structured way. It had a description, how it's used, parameters, and examples. So we could use that structure to deterministically find these small bits of content that could answer the generic types of questions valid for each command, like what are the arguments, how is it used, give me some examples, and so on. We tasked a developer with doing that this time because, well, first we were after efficiency, and secondly, we wanted to take notice of what the technical skills would actually, um, what the required technical skills would be to actually develop chatbots in a more reasonable and usable way. So to develop the chatbot itself, we used ACP Conversational AI, formerly known as Recast. That's an end-to-end -end chatbot building platform using a multilingual natural language processing technology. So since it had an abstract layer for all NLP stuff basically, it allowed us to focus on the architecture and the flow of the whole thing, the whole use case. So it also supported uh, having triggers of the chatbot which uh, executed upon conditions defined by us. 
So uh, they could execute HTTP requests. So we created a backend application kind of for the, chat, for the chatbot to actually download and parse the documentation dynamically right from our documentation source. So um, we deployed that app in the cloud, taught our bot to call its API and work with it. And basically, the result was that we no longer had to maintain anything. You could date the documentation of any command. You could add a command uh, in a week or in a month or whatever. And the chatbot would simply start working with it. Maintenance was basically zero. So what did we get out of this? Well, once again, looking at this table, in terms of content reuse, obviously a big improvement. We were no longer copying and pasting the documentation. And the bot was maintainable, actually. However, we had two severe limitations still. The NLP training was all done manually. All the uh, questions for the commands were actually typed in by hand, by us. They were hard-coded. We were not using anything of the content to actually train the NLP. And then the bot was not very reliable because we were heavily relying on the actual format of the content of the documentation page. Imagine you had a faulty table or symbol or something like that that actually broke the parsing the bot would not be able to respond to the user. In terms of writer empowerment, it was not considered at this stage because, well, there were no technical writers involved even in that project. And in terms of microbots, this is actually when we first thought about that. Since we were uh, using the platform for the first time, obviously we played around with it a bit. And uh, by trying to scale, uh, scale the domain, we saw that the efficiency really got bad at some point. So we started having this uh, concept and idea of uh, having the um, larger network with different agents that communicate in a bot-to-bot -bot way to actually resolve the user request. In it, the CAY bot would just fit as a utility bot uh, for a single use case in, as a single node in that network. So once we were uh, done with both our two prototypes, we kind of took a step back and tried to evaluate what we've done and what we have to um, do forward. So in the Tina prototype, we really liked that everything was done by a technical writer. Tetsu basically said why, but the main thing was that they knew how the product was used, and they were best fit to design the conversation flow and so on. They needed to be on board. However, this came with a lot of very heavy limitations, which made the bot completely unusable in the real world. And we tried to kind of address this uh, in the CAY bot. However, then we lost... Um, the knowledge of the technical writer, which we really valued. So we wanted to take the best of both worlds, basically, and try to um, get the benefits of these two into our next project, which kind of got a lot bigger than these two, had a few versions, each building upon uh, the previous one and what we've learned. So basically, I once again, uh, let Svetan explain about that. Thank you, Pavel. So, after the first two prototypes, it became evident that we needed some kind of abstraction layer for the bot building that also provided some sort of automation. So for our next prototype, we continued working with SAP Conversational AI as it fitted into that idea. It provided APIs for everything, from creating the bot to training the NLP to implementing all the triggers and backend calls. So everything that we did in the first prototypes manually through, through the tool of the platform, we could now do programmatically via APIs. So how do we make use of, the, of those available APIs? Well, for that, we decided to introduce templates, which we call blood, uh, bot blueprints. And those are basically a structured way to hold all of the building blocks of a chatbot. So that will be the NLP training data, the conversation design, or the hooks, triggers, whatever. And all of that in a structured way. Basically, it's a definition of the bot. And we want to use that in order to create chatbots for a specific domain. Now, when we need something exact in that domain, so a specific use case, this blueprint would be provided with additional parameters. And the blueprint together with those parameters will be a bot within the domain, so an exact use case. So we modeled these uh, blueprints. So the structure, semantics, all of those things. And we also created an uh, application to understand them and basically on what is uh, based on what is defined 
in the template and the provided parameters, it would create a chatbot using the APIs of SAP Conversational AI. So what's left now is to have an actual blueprint in order to test all of, the, all of it out, to have something to process. Well, for that, we set our sights on the SAP Cloud Platform Services, hence the name of the project, ServiceBot. So without going into too much details about the product itself, they were suitable because in terms of documentation, all of the services have a common structure. Of course, they have their differences, but they all have a name, a description, release notes, availability information, stuff like that. So you can, for example, ask what's new in the latest release for service X, and for each X, you can go and look up in a central repository the latest release notes. Okay, good. So we then created the blueprint for this particular domain, the SAP Cloud Platform Services, and we also created an application that will enable technical writers to trigger the creation of a blueprint-based bot. So what will happen? Technical writer will open the application, select the blueprint uh, that they want, provide all the necessary uh, parameters for that blueprint, and basically click Go. Then they will wait around a bit, and the bot will be created. So we have a video prepared for this. This is for the specific domain of the SAP Cloud Platform Services. The template for that requires only one parameter, which would be the asset ID. The asset ID is basically some identifier that, uh, that's for the service in the, all the central repositories. The other thing is a display name that's only for the tool, so that, that doesn't matter. So here, after entering the asset ID, the technical writer would click on Create Chatbot, and that would trigger the creation. So then the, the progress can be tracked directly in the tool, in the progress bar. So the steps are getting all of the build time content that we need to actually create the chatbot, then resolving the blueprints, so all the placeholders, taking the parameters, putting in the concrete stuff. And after all that's done, the API calls so we actually get the bot in the platform. After that is done, the technical writer is able to test the bot directly in the tool, so they don't need to go anywhere else. And they can just open it, and have a chat with the chatbot to make sure that everything is fine, nothing, nothing is broken. You can see that here. Okay, so let's summarize now. We, th we thought that this was a very successful prototype, both in terms of content reuse and technical writer empowerment. Because at the same time, the, all the data used by the chatbot was fully reused from central repositories, all of the NLP training was automated, and also this was all done by the technical writer. You saw the video, this was entirely clicked through by a technical writer. They didn't need to do anything else. And we also had, we have very small overhead here in actually creating this chatbot. You saw it just a couple of clicks. And the content that we're using, that is stored in the, in, stored in the central repository, that's already maintained there, because there are other use cases for that content. So, yeah, almost zero overhead, just a couple of clicks, even for a brand new service within the platform. Now, in terms of microbots, here, still no progress. Although, we did make note that such an implementation would be kind of suitable for this whole idea of intercommunicating bots and bot network. Why? Well, because the services of the SAP Cloud Platform being part of the Cloud Platform is the larger pro product, they have their interdependencies, they contribute to common scenarios, so they have touch points. And those can be modeled by such a network. Okay, so now we have the ability to create a chatbot for virtually any service within the SAP Cloud Platform with a set of core capabilities that fully reuse existing content. All the technical writer or the chatbot creator has to do is just click a couple of buttons. And we were really happy with how this approach pan out. So naturally, we wanted to expand upon it. So our next prototype was a second version of the service bot. And here, our main goal was to include the actual documentation, not just on peripheral systems, in the content reuse capabilities. And we wanted to do that by leveraging metadata. So why metadata? Well, metadata is a convenient way to propagate the intentions of the technical writer 
to technical components that are consuming their content. So even though that's not visible content for the readers of the documentation, the human readers, it's useful for stuff like our chatbot in order to better understand the context of the content. So, um, that we already had a suitable mechanism in our documentation. And that's the so-called task content. So these are pages which are basically step-by-step -step guides for technical procedures, and those are tagged within our documentation. Also, there are steps, there are prerequisites, um, examples, they're also marked with, within the page. And this is how one such page looks like. You can see prerequisites, context, procedure, which are the steps. So we identified this as a perfect candidate for our prototype here. As a secondary goal, we also wanted to explore stateful bots. So what do I mean by this? When, when you ask how to do something, you're asking for a task, right? So you're in the context of that task. So you can then ask some qualifi qualifications, like um, show me an example, what are the prerequisites, tell me more about step two. If you look at those questions in isolation, they, they're vague, you don't know an, an example for what, right? But when you just before asked for the particular task, we're in the context of that, so we know what you mean by an example. So this is what we want to achieve when we talk about uh, stateful boss here. Okay, so in order to achieve this, we introduced um, two abstract concepts, actions and entities. Actions being something you perform on an entity. For example, you can create, delete, edit, which would be actions, uh, image, a document, uh, configuration, which would be entities. And in theory, for each valid combination of an action and an entity, there should be a corresponding task page within the documentation. So, how do we apply this in practice now? Well, the concept of action, actions and entities is not something that's pre-existent in our documentation, so we need to introduce it. So for that, we identified the target cloud platform service, and its technical writer, who by the way, being part of our chatbot team, made the choice quite easy for us. And we went through all the task pages and marked them with the appropriate actions and entities. And with that, the content was fully ready to be consumed uh, by this prototype. Nothing more needed. Next step was to actually modify the blueprint. So the v ServiceBot V1 blueprint had to be enhanced to accommodate this new uh, functionality, the task retrieval. So we did that, we added all the necessary expressions for training the NLP, triggers, skills, webhooks, whatever. And this was done without, uh, with pretty much minimal changes to the blueprint, and it also did not require any further input in terms of parameters, still only the asset ID. So now we have a new blueprint, the V2 blueprint, and the bot can be created with that. And that bot can be asked something like, how do I create a new service instance? And the chatbot will pick up that you're looking for a task because you're asking for how to do something. And we also pick up that your action is create and your entity is service instance. So it will go to the documentation and it will try to find a task page that is tagged with those actions and entities. If found, the bot will go into a special state for procedural explanation fed with all the content from that task page. So this in turn enables the follow-up questions I talked about earlier. So you're now in the context and you can ask something like, show me a, an example, and the bot will immediately show you the example section from the uh, task page without needing to go back to the documentation and uh, extracting it again because it will be in the context. Okay, so let's summarize this one. In terms of content reuse, although the same color as above, it was actually stronger here because we made use of more content. And we actually made use of the main source of content, which is the documentation and its metadata. So that was a great achievement. In terms of technical writer empowerment, it was exactly the same as before. The experience was absolutely the same as you saw in the video. 
So nothing changed, it and we were still happy with this. In terms of microbots, we moved from vague statements um, that we just uh, throw in the, in the air to something on the whiteboard now. So we started actually modeling how the bot hierarchy will work for the specific domain of the SAP Cloud Platform services. Still nothing concrete though. So this is what we have done at this point and what we have already learned. So now I just want to take a few minutes to talk about what we're currently working on, which would be a version three of the service bot. And let's look at our goals for that. In terms of content reuse, we want to make sure that we use all of the content we have available to us, not just specific parts of it. So for that, we want to have a single data source that the chatbot will use exclusively for its data. To achieve this, we're building something like a knowledge graph from all of our available resources. And the idea is that the chatbot will traverse that graph in order to pick the best answer to a user query. In terms of technical writer empowerment, we want to let the, the technical writers deviate from the base template we provide. So for this, we want to introduce the concept of layering for our bot templates. And the idea behind these layers is, is that they can add, modify, or remove chatbot functionality from the template. And they can also stack one after the other and also be reused. And the idea is that the technical writer, the, the technical writer can customize the, um, the chatbot that they will eventually have, building with uh, this approach, to best fit their particular service, their particular use case. And of course, we want this to be in an easy and user-friendly way, so of course, we'll enhance our UI with um, the functionality to work with these um, layers. In terms of microbots, we, have to, we want to finally see a working example of bot-to-bot -bot communication, not just something on the whiteboard. So for that, we want to identify all of the dependencies of the service we're prototyping with, and we want to create a chatbot for each of them. They don't have to be as fully featured as the main bot, they just need to prove that when the main bot is asked about something that is related to one of its dependencies, the user query or a modified version of it will be routed appropriately. So this pretty much sums up uh, our, pro of our prototypes and this version three of the service bot is what we'll be focusing in, uh, on in the coming weeks. Um, yeah, thanks Satan for that overview of the service bot. As you said, this actually um, closes up the overview of everything that uh, we've worked upon until now. And um, I will actually try to take some uh, key points out. So firstly, to, um, well, building chatbots for a very simple use cases is very easy, really easy, especially using such platforms that we've used. However, as you grow the scope of the content that the chatbot is serving, as well as trying to enhance its capabilities, it quickly gets quite complex. I hope that we have made that clear. Secondly, to actually um, have chatbots provide real value uh, in the actual, uh, your actual business, uh, they have to be easily maintainable and scalable. And for that, they have to reuse any available content in any possible available way, basically in intelligently reuse any content. Thirdly, the people who are best fit to actually uh, run chatbots, well, develop them, maintain them, whatever you call it, um, are the ones whose role allows them to have the best cumulative knowledge of the content, the subject of the content, and also the way it's used, meaning its consumers. In our case, these were obviously technical writers because we were focusing on documentation. In other use cases, these uh, would be different people, but however, the main point is that in general, most probably the person who owns the content should also own the bot, as it makes most sense. And finally, to have better NLP efficiency, to achieve better parallel work processes, and be able to distribute the responsibility between different teams, collaborators, and so on, a divide and conquer approach is very suitable for implementing chatbots, kind of in a network way, with small agents um, that are responsible for each domain w when these could be separated to different teams, and hence parallelize um, a lot of work and responsibilities to avoid a lot of issues. So that's actually all we have uh, prepared. I hope it was valuable and interesting.
I see that we don't have time for any questions, sorry for that. But if you have any questions or feedback, we'll be available anywhere in the venue. So if you find us, come have a chat, pun intended. So thank you for your time and for your attention, and have a nice cocktail party later.